Hello, and welcome to episode six of Read, Return, Repeat, a Read ICT podcast. I'm your host, Sarah McNeil, Adult Programming Librarian for the Wichita Public Library. In today's episode, titled Literature from the Heartland, we will explore Category 12, a Kansas notable book with State Librarian of Kansas, Eric Norris. Mr. Norris is the 17th State Librarian of Kansas and leads his team in providing services and resources that meet the needs of libraries and residents throughout the state. Later in the episode, we will hear original works by local writers read aloud by library staff. Wichita is one of the four communities to receive short edition short story dispensers through the generosity of the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation. And the project is meant to encourage folks to read wherever you are, in a coffee shop, at a doctor's office, and even at the library. Eric, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. We really do appreciate you making the time to join us today. Uh, We'll just go ahead and get started. So can you tell our listeners about yourself and how you came to hold the position of State Librarian of Kansas? Yes. uh, As you stated before, my name is Eric Norris. I've been in public libraries for uh, getting close to 15 years now. I do consider the State Library is is very much a public library as well. Uh, I got my start in uh, Hayes, Kansas at the Hayes Public Library where I started as the adult department librarian and did that job for a number of years before I was able to uh, make the move into the director position at the Hayes Public Library, which I held for close to six years. Um, You know, when you just jump into uh, librarianship in a medium-sized Kansas town and they kind of hand you the key and say, go for it. You've got some experience already going into it, but you're really not sure what you're, what you're walking into. And it's kind of, a, uh, you know, you take your, everything you learned in your library science program and you try to apply it the best you can. And uh, quite honestly, when I saw the, um, when I saw the advertisement that went out for, uh, that they were looking for a, a state librarian, I really did some soul searching about what it means to uh, serve in that capacity. I, talk to as many people as I could. And I, I put my name in the ring and was lucky enough to be selected for that. Yeah. I, you know, until library school, I really didn't even know that position even existed. Um, I really didn't even understand the breadth that the state library has touching all of the libraries in Kansas or state libraries in general. And so, you know, that it's, it's almost like, it seems that this position you are kind of Oz, you know, we have all of these amazing resources and you're the person manipulating those to disseminate those to all of our, uh, our libraries in Kansas. It, it can be a little bit like that. Uh, it, sometimes it, it's, this past year doesn't really count all that much because there's been a lot of times yeah. in the office, but, you know, I really look forward to getting back out on the road, meeting librarians, walking into all sorts of different libraries across the state. But I was very much in the same way that uh, before I got into librarianship, I wasn't really aware of the state library. Uh, And then when I became, uh, as I was moving through my position as the adult department librarian, I became very aware of it. And and that's how it, that's how it landed on my radar. But it is one of those challenges that we face to where you are so big that you kind of blend into the background quite a bit, so. Right, and your library is at the Capitol, correct? So you're yeah. kind of embedded in all of that state government there. Um, yep, if you've never been here, we are on the third floor of the state Capitol, right in between the floors of the uh, House and the Senate. Okay, great. Yeah, I haven't ever made it up to Topeka. I know that's terrible. I've lived in Kansas over a decade. Uh, I need to make it up there sometime. And I've seen pictures online, um, and it looks magnanimous and yeah, just really beautiful. Um, yes. Well, um, so for today's episode, you know, and our challenge, we have uh, Category 12, which is a Kansas notable book. And this differs from previous challenges where we've had the luxury of having authors come to the state and give author talks. And so generally, Category 12 is an author that visits Kansas. Well, we had to kind of be creative this year because there weren't a lot of author visits. And 
we tried to do the virtual author visit that counts last year and it worked, but it was like, we're really stretching here. You know, we were even counting Elton John who like performed or was set to perform, but couldn't perform, but he wrote a, you know, a biography. So, mm-hmm. um, our team, when we came up with the categories, we thought, you know, Kansas Notable Books, this has been around for a while. This is a, it's really important that our customers get in touch with those stories um, just to familiarize themselves with not only the authors that write uh, from Kansas, but then stories that showcase Kansas uh, in and of itself. And so um, can you explain to our customers a little bit about your project, uh, what it is and how it was created? Absolutely. The uh, Kansas Notable Book Project itself Uh, It's a project of the Kansas Center for the Book, which is a state library program that uh, we serve as the affiliate to the Library of Congress Center for the Book. So we're the state affiliate for the Library of Congress Center for the Book. And uh, and we are using that platform to sort of highlight uh, the state's literary heritage, uh, fostering interest in books and reading in libraries. And one of those projects that was created very early in this was uh, the Kansas Novel Book. It started in 2006. So this is our 16th year. Uh, every year we select 15 books to highlight. And, it, you know, we try to feature quality titles with wide public appeal, either written by Kansans or about Kansas related topics. Uh, and they have to be published within the previous year. So that's really one uh, the three parameters that kind of fall in there. They're either by a Kansas author, they're about a Kansas topic, and they must be published within the last year. So uh, in the past 16 years, that puts us at highlighting about 240 books. And uh, it's it's quite a collection. Yeah, and that was really appealing for us because it's like our customers can choose between 240 different titles instead of just limiting it to this author yeah. came to the state. And something I'd like to add with that is that we do uh, every year when we release the Kansas Notable Book list, we do make a grant available through uh, federal funds that we receive for libraries to purchase uh, the titles that are on that list. Uh, If you've already purchased, if a library's already purchased that title, uh, they can be reimbursed for the cost of that and also pick up titles they don't have in their collection. So that way uh, it helps us to, uh, it helps us to do a general uh, collection development, if you will, across the state of Kansas with the, with the Kansas Notable Books and make them more available to uh, Kansas citizens all across the state. That's great. Cause you know, I've looked at the lists and some of them are published by big, bigger publishing houses. Others look like they're self-published. Um, mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. that kind of creates equity for all of those authors and the libraries to get their hands on those books, especially. And I know with our library in particular, you know, we go through vendors. And so we are limited in what books we can purchase uh, directly because they have to. We have to have those agreements already with those vendors, unless that author um, donates that book to us. Um, so absolutely, absolutely. And we start talks with a lot of uh, with a lot of smaller publishers and the independent booksellers across the state. Uh, our reference librarian Cindy Roop does a good job of communicating out what these titles are going to be to some of those smaller. Uh, Kansas independent booksellers so they can they can reach out and and, uh, and provide those books if, if libraries need that service because you're right some of these titles are very small runs some of them are published and uh, they're just not available in a lot of a lot of those large book jobber formats right and you want to like you, we were saying create that equity because it's such an honor to be chosen but then if you can't get your book out then mm-hmm. yeah it, it becomes moot at that point so um, well, that's really great. Um, so, well, we're going to take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking about the process of submitting a book to the Kansas Notable Book Committee and recommendations from our own state librarian. So stay tuned. The Wichita Public Library's Library of Things offers a variety of equipment customers can borrow for at-home use. We have Steam2Go kits for children, fourth grade and older, radon detectors, telescopes, and wireless hotspots. Visit wichitalibrary.org to learn more. 
Welcome back to the show. We're here with State Librarian Eric Norris, and we've been talking about the Kansas Notable Book Project and how the Kansas Notable Book lists are compiled each year. Um, how can an author submit uh, their work or someone recommend a book for consideration? Uh, or, or are there any tips? You know, Do you have any advantages or um, can you give us any advice when, when it comes to that process? Um, by going to our website, there's a link that lists out the information about the Kansas Notable Books, but you can, an author can either self-submit by reaching out to the State Library staff, and there is a, there is a, uh, an email link on there that would, would go to the person who is rounding those up for us throughout the year. Uh, you can also send books into, uh, send books into the State Library. And as I said, you can either, uh, self-nominate, you can submit them yourself. If you're a librarian out there, or even I believe just regular Kansans who, who you know, know of a book that was published last year that they really enjoy and falls uh, within those other two parameters, uh, they, can, they can recommend that a book be considered for the, for the Kansas Notable Book. So uh, there's an email address. I believe that we're working on an online form for submissions to make it a little bit easier. And one thing that does help us out with it is if you can, um, uh, especially some of the some of the smaller titles. If you would send us a copy of the book, that way we can at least get started uh, with with the committee and and start that selection process. And then another function that we do is is uh, books that are out there. We uh, to round them up for the committee. We actually use interlibrary loan a lot. So we'll go yeah, and request those books for our committee members. And, uh, and so they can kind of start that process. But um, it's just a matter of reaching out throughout the year. So uh, we really try to keep this information, uh, you know, we really try to talk about the notable books. So that way, if you've come across a book that you've really enjoyed and it fits those criteria, you can let us know about it. So if we have any local authors or writers in the audience and they want to submit a book, uh, what, what's the deadline for that? Because I know they're usually chosen in the summertime. So do you have a hard and fast deadline for those authors? You know, we don't have a hard and fast deadline for it, but uh, the first quarter of the year uh, is, is when the committee is really, really hitting it, really hitting it hard and trying to make those decisions. We will receive... Uh, upwards of 150 to 200 title suggestions. And so it's usually a, a committee of about eight to 12, I believe is, is what we try to hit every year for that. So it's a lot of titles to get through. Um, I know they start, that selection committee kind of starts their process as soon as they start getting titles in. But by April is when the selection committee tries to uh, dwindle it down to 25 books. And then that recommendation of 25 books will hit my desk. And then I have a, you know, I have a tall order of going through and selecting 15 out of that list. And it's, uh, it's, it, it's fun. It's very exciting. Uh, I really enjoy it. And it's also a little heartbreaking. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've made the suggestion of why can't we change it to 20? <laughs> Thankfully, <laughs> they've kept it within the parameters of 15, just, just for, you know, continuity and all that. But, uh, but it's it's a fun process to go through. I make a lot of discoveries of titles that I've that I've never uh, that I've never heard, and it's it's a fun process, but it's daunting. So you mentioned that there's a committee that chooses um, these books and then sends them on to you. Uh, how do you select those committee members? Are they constantly changing or evolving every year, or do you have veterans that come back? Um, a little bit of both. We've, we've got some veterans who do a really good job, but we reach out uh, and try to get a wide, um, you know, a wide selection of professionals uh, from librarians, teachers, academics, authors themselves, uh, who don't, obviously the authors won't have any books that are in consideration for that. Uh, but, you know, we have people that have come back and served for several years, and then a lot of times we're looking for volunteers. And if there is somebody out there that would like to, uh, that's either a librarian, excuse me, a librarian or an educator, uh, you know, reach out to us and, and let us know that you'd like to volunteer on the committee because we're always looking for volunteers. Oh, very cool. Yeah, you can be part of history here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Do it's you, a great way to uh, think about it. Right. Do you, so as one um, one assumption that all of these authors or librarians or folks are in Kansas or living in Kansas, or do you even cast your net wider and ask 
people from surrounding states to participate in that committee? Uh, we keep it to we keep it to Kansas residents. Uh, we figure that the way the parameter is set up with the Kansas Notable Books, uh, that we really like for this to be a to be a homegrown project, and so we we generally keep it to uh, uh, Kansans. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, well. Um, you mentioned that you know people can submit books, um, either the author themselves or someone can submit on their behalf. Um, are there any book recommendations from the Kansas Notable Book Project, past or present, that you personally have enjoyed or would recommend to our listeners? Um, we're always looking for recommendations to share with our listeners. You know, it is. Uh, I, I will go back and share the stories that uh, in. I'm trying to think of of. The position I was in, I was, I was the uh, the adult department librarian at Hayes, and this book came out by uh, Albert Goldbarth. He is a creative writing instructor there at WSU, and um, I really enjoyed his poetry for several years. And he published a book in 2007 that was called The Kitchen Sink. It's new and selected poetry from I think 72 up through 2007. And uh, I just absolutely loved it and reached out to the state library and made that recommendation. And I was thrilled when that book was selected in 2008 for a, for a Kansas Notable book. But um, so that happens to be one of my personal mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the collection, but there's just so many of them. And I actually went through uh, just yesterday and wrote down some of the titles that I've enjoyed. Uh, uh, from the Kansas Notable Books. From that point forward, I started kind of looking at it. The last couple of years, obviously, I've been looking at it a little bit closer, but I really enjoy, um, and granted, this doesn't weigh into my selection of what goes on the title because that takes, that takes a little bit of skill and a little bit of art. But the things that I'm interested in when I go back and, and look through the collection itself are those stories that talk about, you know, Kansas as not just a place, but as an idea and also sort of talks about, you know, where Kansans come up with their identity and what makes us, whether it's our geography or whether it's our beliefs. Um, those are the, those are the, the stories that I like. And I tend to tend to, uh, you know, focus in on a little bit of the nonfiction. I like the personal essays. Mm -hmm. that come out. You know, some of the titles that really stood out to me are Wild Places of Kansas, I wrote down the date of when these were on the notable book list. Wild Places of Kansas in 2017, I really enjoyed. Uh, Headlights on the Prairie um, in 2018, uh, an essay book that came out of Dodge City. Uh, Elevations by Max McCoy was just fantastic. Uh, the Pizza Hut story going way back then. <laughs> really enjoyed the, the history of that franchise. Uh, no Place Like Home uh, from 2020 was a fantastic book about about how Kansas addresses uh, addresses social issues. Um, life on the ground in a rectangular state, uh, the flyover people. Uh, mm -hmm. Life on the ground is the the subtitle for that, but I just absolutely love that. Uh, but it really you know dives into it dives into how we reflect upon our identity from an outward focus. Uh, Kansas Explorer's Guide by Marcy Penner. You know, there's there's titles like that that I'm really drawn to that actually open up parts of Kansas to me as a lifelong Kansan uh, and 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 introduce me to parts of parts of my home state that I wasn't aware of. Definitely, we recently had Marcy Penner um, do a virtual talk on that uh, her second edition of that book, and it was really fascinating. All the places that her and her co-author had visited and showing those um, and just kind of gave us, inspired us to get out there and want to travel and see these, you know, structures that, that are so fascinating that you don't often see um, just in your everyday life. Did, did you happen to catch her KLA talk when she talked about libraries across Kansas? I did not. Years no. ago. Mm -mm. It was fantastic. She, uh, she's a fantastic presenter but had highlighted, you know, public libraries that are some of her favorites to visit across the state. She's, she's incredible. Yeah. I often find myself doing that on vacation, visiting libraries. I know my <laughs> family gets tired of it, but I'm like, Oh, did you see that beautiful library? <laughs> like we need to go I, <laughs> I hear you there. I hear you there. <laughs> yeah, no, that's wonderful. Um, well, uh, 
Yeah, we've we've had a couple of different authors talk about uh, local places in town, and um, we try and showcase authors as much as we can. But your project in particular really does get uh, Kansans, residents of Kansas out there reading about Kansas or incorporating those stories, which is phenomenal because, you mm -hmm. know, there is a, this movement of heritage and pride that you can see a resurgence of people wanting to find out their histories. Um, I remember the first time I read Willa Cather's um, My Antonia, not taken place in Kansas, but the way that she described the plains in such a bitterly beautiful landscape. It just really like was tugging at my heartstrings. I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that, you know, a place that I sort of took for granted growing up in the plains uh, could be so beautiful mm -hmm. to someone else. Um, so. Oh, absolutely. And we could, we could talk thunderstorms and sunsets and sunrises for a while. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I happen to be a big fan of myself. Yeah, no, definitely. Well, hey, we're going to take another quick break. Uh, when we come back, we'll be talking about the State Library of Kansas and how it offers support to Kansas libraries and other projects that the State Library offers to Kansas residents beyond the Kansas Notable Book Project. So stay with us. Have you heard about our short story dispensers? We have three in Wichita for you to enjoy. One at Reverie Roasters, Hunter Health Clinic, and Oblo Library at Wichita State. The dispensers print out a short story for you to enjoy, and now you can submit your own for consideration in the collection. Find out more at our website, wichitalibrary.org. Tired of buying ink for your printer? Your public library has you covered. Upload your print jobs to the library website from the comfort of your home or use the Printer On app with your mobile device. Find out more by visiting wichitalibrary.org slash print. Welcome back to the show. We're here with Eric Norris, and we've been talking about the process of submitting books to the Kansas Notable Book Committee and recommendations of the Kansas Notable Books from our own state librarian. Um, so obviously the State Library of Kansas, uh, you had mentioned receives funding from the federal government. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how your programs or your resources facilitate support for libraries in Kansas and how that kind of trickles down? Absolutely. We actually receive funding from two, uh, from two sources. The major, uh, the major component of our budget comes from the state general fund. We are a governor's agency. Uh, meaning that the state library in my position is, is appointed by the governor and serves at the will of the governor. And the state library itself is one of the, one of the 85 or 90 uh, uh, governor's agencies that are out there. And that means that we secure, we secure the majority of our funding through the state general fund uh, as, the, as the governor puts it together and submits it to the legislature. Um, Along with that, though, we are supplemented by the Institute of Museums and Library Services. Uh, we receive an annual federal grant uh, that's called the, collectively, it's called the Grants to States Program. And uh, I think people, librarians out there may be familiar with it as the Library Service and Technology Act, LSC right. funds that come out. And um, between those two budget sources, our main purpose is to provide services and support to state agencies, uh, to librarians and educators across the state, as well as to uh, any, any Kansan out there who is looking for services. So part of our looking for library services. Uh, so part of that, what we do is we push out a lot of um, uh, statewide databases and, mm -hmm. uh, and collection opportunities that are out there that uh, are generally just open to the public, that somebody can just go to our website and and dig through our online resources and have access to, as well as providing uh, ebook content, uh, ebook and digital audio content. And some of those programs do require uh, uh, a verification. So we offer um, what's we, what we call the State Library e-card. Um, any Kansan, Kansas resident is able to receive an e-card and you can either call us and we can get you set up or email us and we can get you set up. But I prefer to have people go to their public library and ask for the uh, state library e-card because they can issue you one there as well. And if you've never been to your public library, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to walk through the doors 
and uh, and be able to get set up. And, and hopefully you would have a librarian that can step you through the resources that we have. Um, and if not, we have staff that's that's ready to help you as well. So what it comes down to is that that uh, you know our budget is set up to serve the 2.9 million people of Kansas every year. Yeah, we we definitely encourage our customers when they come in and get their first card to get an e-card through the State Library of Kansas. And all you need is your driver's license. And it's wonderful because, um, you know, we can only lease or purchase so many e-books with our material funds. So we can off, obviously um, refer folks to use Cloud Library um, now, uh, or like you said, those databases. And a lot of the databases that we have here at the library, we get from the State Library of Kansas. There are very few that we actually purchase ourselves. We use a lot of the ones that you and your your team um, secure for us. That is fantastic to hear because, you know, we see the stats that come through. Uh, we, the more that those resources are being used, the more justification we have for being able to ask for the budget to pay for them every year. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's wonderful to hear that. You see the stats that come in on it sometimes, but what's even more rewarding is when you talk to somebody who, you know, uh, I'll talk to a, a professor at a community college that says, you know, we set our curriculums up by using the Epsco databases. Uh, or um, one of the resources that we recently uh, re-offered because we used to offer it several years ago was Tumble Books. Mm -hmm. Set up a contract with Tumble Books, which is, uh, it is stories and picture books and interactive games uh, for pre-K through sixth grade students. And uh, when we set up the contract here this year that just was released in 2021, we were able to include uh, elementary schools as uh, users for that. So any any teacher who obviously gets the okay from their administration can go in and uh, use that resource in the classroom. Definitely. I think, especially in the wake of 2020 and um, everything that happened, places being shut down, those resources have really been utilized. Um, you know, we started issuing e-cards over the phone or mm -hmm. customers had regular full access cards, we would issue them e-cards over the phone for the State Library of Kansas just to get folks um, connected with those resources if they couldn't come to the library or weren't, weren't able to. So it is so valuable to have um, to the to have those resources available to our customers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and part of our ebook collection and digital audio through uh, through. Um, Cloud Library, Jesus, slipped my mind there for a second. <laughs> okay. Is to help supplement, um, you know, those collections that are out there already. And like you said, um, you know, even a library the size of, of Wichita may not have the resources to put into everything that that the people of Wichita need. Um, you know, you can use the state library to build that base first, and then really fine tune the collection if you're, you know, if you're needing to do that. But uh, to be able to use the state library's resources to to build upon, and that's that's ultimately what our goal is, because there are plenty of small libraries out there across Kansas who can't afford those resources. We have a lot of really small libraries that, you know, they they work really hard to keep the doors open, and uh, so we just try to provide as many resources that that we can push out to them that they can make available uh, as well, so that way they can keep their you know, keep their local dollars focused in on where they need to be and still have uh, still have online collections or um, interlibrary loan, uh, you know, for uh, for physical items that would be available for them. So uh, that's ultimately the goal is is to um, is to help supplement communities resources in, in, across the state. Now, one thing um, I was just thinking about is uh, in the state of Kansas, we have regional offices um, for different library systems. Does the state library have a relationship with those offices? I know when I worked in interlibrary loan briefly, um, we would send out our book sets to those regional offices and they would loan those out to other libraries. Um, I know that you can also, like you mentioned, interlibrary loan books uh, for your committee members. Does the state library kind of coordinate those offices or how does that play into um, getting books to different parts of the state? 
So there are seven regional library systems across the state and the state library works in coordination with uh, them individually as well as a group. Uh, we, uh, the state, I myself meet with the, with the regional directors monthly. Uh, we discuss things that are going on uh, in each one of the systems. We talk about ways that we can create partnerships. Those regional systems are created by statutes and they're their own entity. They have their own board. Uh, they their own decision, they're their own, they're, they are their own organization, uh, and we just coordinate our efforts in, in a way to try to help them, you know, serve their member libraries as well. And then we do reach out, you know, we're kind of an umbrella that reaches out across the entire state to help, uh, as we were kind of talking about, provide some of those services. Um, but we work in coordination with those regional systems to make sure that, that we have library services saturated across right. Kansas. So that way there's nobody that's going to be, uh, you know, without services if they, if they need them or, or choose to come find them. Um, so I kind of lost track of the question there. <laughs> that's okay. I was just kind of, I, I didn't know um, your connection with those regional offices. Yes. And, and so I was curious, like how much, uh, how much your office touched those. If it, like you said, you were just kind of, coordinating them together, but they sound, sounds like they work autonomously as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's a spirit of cooperation that, that works between all the regional systems in the state library. That's fascinating. Yeah. And yeah. Wichita just happens to be in the South central, South central. Uh, Kansas library system. So Sickles is where we, uh, where mm -hmm. we, that's our home base, but. Uh, yep. 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 Uh, and mm -hmm. you brought up the idea of uh, interlibrary loan. I know we're drifting away from uh, notable books here a little bit. But we, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> uh, I just, I get excited talking about library, uh, libraries and librarians and library issues. So uh, yeah, the, the interlibrary loan program uh, is set up through the, the Kansas Library Network and, um, or Kansas Library Express, excuse me. Mm -hmm. This library um, supplements the, uh, the, basically the catalog to where interlibrary loan items are shared and tracked between each individual library. And then uh, one of the regional systems oversees the Kansas Library Express and works to contract out to make sure that that courier system functions either three to five day stops, depending on depending on what, what a library would want or need. Uh, so we help supplement the, the software to to make the exchanges possible and to track those titles. And then we also do contribute into the costs uh, to secure the to secure the carrier to make sure those books physically move across the state. Which is really important uh, for our listeners to understand the nuances of sending books out. Um, Wichita being such a large library, we get lots of requests from small libraries um, for mm -hmm. either book sets or individual books. And we do use KLE, the Kansas uh, Learning Express, um, to send those books out because we can get them out quick. Um, we use a couple of different courier services, but that one in particular, it seems to be the fastest. And it's just because... Um, the relationships we have with those those different libraries and also the courier that we're using. So um, it's a secure way for us to get our materials um, out to the greater community in Kansas. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, we've got one final question for you. Um, so what are some of the other reading initiatives or projects that the State Library of Kansas has to offer? Obviously, we've talked about Kansas Notable Books. We've talked about how you support libraries with their online databases. But there are some other things that maybe our listeners aren't aware of that they could share with their family members or uh, community members. And I'd like for you to um, touch on those with us. Um, one that... that that comes to mind, <clears throat> excuse me, one that comes to mind first is another uh, uh, Kansas Center for the Book program that we put out is called uh, Kansas Reads to Preschoolers. And every year there's a committee of librarians that are put, that come together to select uh, a, a pre-K title that we can, that we can push out and, and highlight. Uh, in the month of November, we select a week that, that we highlight this title and, uh, and that book is actually just selected as a pre-K title. I don't think that there's any, any real parameters that are put into the selection of that title. Like it doesn't have to be about Kansas. It doesn't have to focus 
stuff. It just has to be a quality book. And um, uh, we have a coordinator uh, on staff at one of our reference librarians, Nicole Hansen, that, that uh, works with that um, works with that selection committee as well to come up with a with a title uh, that that we feel it would be a fun read for the for the pre-K students every year. And and we're starting to work through some of the nuances and challenges. Last year, we selected a title uh, that was available um, online. And right. we're not, let me backtrack just a second here, because when we make that selection uh, of that title, then any library that would like that book, we will purchase them a copy of that book uh, and send it to them. And then hopefully then they can set up programs during the month of November uh, and share with us kind of kind of story times and what they're doing. So going back to last year, we didn't have that uh, option necessarily available because, uh, you know, uh, the courier was slowing down. People didn't know about sharing items. Uh, physical items were in question about how you would handle them. So we did select a title that was available um, online mm -hmm. exclusively. So that way we could just push this link out and, and make it available. And, and we did open it up for the month of November and December for uh, unlimited use at that point. Um, you know, but as, as we're moving forward, we're really trying to pay more attention to uh, a title that would be very inclusive. Um, one that would, would, you know, reach across all sorts of, of children's ways that they see their families, the way that they see themselves, um, how they interact with their communities. Uh, we try to be as inclusive as we can. Um, uh, this year, we, uh, we selected a title, unfortunately, that the, the Spanish language uh, uh, runs were out of print. And I first initially looked at the title, I thought to myself, um, you know, that's always in the back of my mind. If we can find that title, if we can find that title, I did a quick search. I thought it was available. And so I said, perfect, here we can we can run these out because in uh, 2019, we actually had, if you wanted to purchase an English and or a Spanish language uh, uh, version of the book, you could do that as well. So I was excited to do that this year. And unfortunately realized that uh, selected title that didn't have uh, a Spanish language title in print. And so we've worked with the publisher Scholastic uh, to come up with an agreement to, to film the book being read uh, by, a, by a children's librarian and be able to push that video out. And, and also with a little bit of brainstorming, we're looking for uh, somebody to do the story in American Sign Language and record that one as well and push it out just in an effort to be more inclusive and we're, we're uh, continue to look to ways to do that. But um, so Kansas Reads to Preschoolers is one of the, you know, one of the other projects that we've got going on out there, as well as the eBooks, Tumble Books, uh, BookFlix is another one for children, uh, younger children, there's more story time and, and, and image related stories that, that children can watch with their parents. Uh, we also offer a resource called Novelist, where you can explore uh, book reviews. Um, there's there's uh, professional book reviews, and I think actually um, readers can rate books as they go through as well. Uh, you get all the publishing information about all sorts of titles that you're looking for. It's very handy for, you know, collection development in a library setting um, if you don't have the time to flip through the pages every month of the library journal. Um, but it also works if there are you know, people out there that are looking for uh, read-alikes or looking for other genre titles out there that haven't explored before. So the two main ones that we have that go through the Kansas Center for the book right now are the uh, Notable Book and the Reads to Preschoolers. That's great. Yeah, we um, we use novelists a lot for reader's advisory <laughs> here. As a library school student, I used it a lot when I had to make infographics or if I had to... Um, yeah, build websites, anything. It's so great because like you said, it gives you read-alikes, title read-alikes, author read-alikes. You can compile lists, you know, you can <laughs> snag those pictures. It's nice. I do like to use Goodreads, but it is nice to go to an authoritative source like novelists where the publishers are writing these reviews and it's not crowdsourced. So um, absolutely. That's, I, I do like the crowdsource. I, I do like uh, I do like hearing other people's opinions about books, uh, you know, readers that I think I have may have something in common with, but, but you're right, that authoritative source to where 
uh, professional reviews are coming through and they're being weighed out uh, against criteria that's already been set up there. It makes it, it makes it easier for, um, you know, a more stable collection development to be uh, as a process to go through and to be able to justify why you're purchasing certain titles. Definitely. And one project I, I wanted you to touch on um, that creates equity is your talking book project. Um, I oh, believe yeah. that that also falls under your umbrella. We used to have uh, that facility here in Wichita eons ago before my time, but I know now it's up at the state library. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that project? Yeah. Um, and sorry, I didn't bring that up earlier. I think of the talking books as actually a division of the, of the state library as, a, as one of our three services, one of our general three services that we, that we provide, but the uh, uh, Kansas talking books is uh, is an affiliate for the National Library of Service for the Blind and the Print Disabled, which is also a Library of Congress uh, affiliate as well. And so we are the state center. The Kansas Talking Books is the state affiliate for, for that NLS. And uh, it does just that. It provides services and, and resources and materials to uh, Kansans who are either pl- blind or print disabled. Uh, they changed some of the wording at the at the federal level to be a little bit more inclusive because uh, it was just the National Library Services for the Blind. However, a lot of the materials that they do provide, uh, the s- specific playback devices that they have are set up for people with maybe mobility issues that are disabled in terms of you can't turn the page of a book very easily. Right. Uh, or uh, maybe you are unable to, to manipulate an iPhone, or maybe you know because of your situation, you can't afford the iPhone to get some of these services or you know, a smartphone. Um, you can get signed up uh, to the program and have those materials sent to your house directly for free. That's wonderful. And it so like you said, it's like a player, almost like an it's not an A track or a cassette player, but it, it looks like it, where you you insert a, an actually pre recorded book and then it plays it for you. Absolutely, and it it does. It looks like an old. Uh, it looks like how I remember the cassette recorders, the real right. basic ones that would kind of come through. Uh, the you know, the uh, the information in the book, the story, the newspaper article, the, the magazine that you're wanting shows up on uh, on a basically a flash drive, but it is designed in a way that it's easy to grab. It's easy to manipulate. It's not really like a fine little flash drive. It's a larger, mm-hmm. uh, larger physical object that's easier for some some folks to uh, handle and manage. And, you know, you you slide it into the you slide it into the player and it and it's it's tracks where you're at. I mean, it does a lot of these utilitarian things that keep you on track for either the book you're reading or the newspaper article. And um, the service though is adapting. Uh, within the last couple of years, they've made some major changes in their uh, in their service platforms. And it really used to be that there'd be, you know, the titles floating around out there at each one of the state affiliates uh, to where, you know, maybe there would be some sci-fi book that that you would be wanting, but it would be housed in Georgia. So they would oh. pull out these would be moved through the system and mailed to that particular patron here in Kansas. Um, and it was, uh, you know, one book per, per uh, you know, per flash drive. And I call them flash drives. Michael Lang, our director uh, mm-hmm. down at Talking Books is probably wincing because there's a better name for that than flash drive. It's not necessarily flash drive. But, um, but so it used to be the system that would go through the mail and they are changing it to a downloadable, uh, a downloadable type of service to where a Kansas patron would put a request in for a specific title and the staff at, at our talking book services, which is located in the basement of the union at Emporia, uh, they're able to get onto, you know, get into a closed database and download that particular title uh, oh. for the patron. So it is much quicker turnaround time. Um, it actually makes uh, the availability uh, of the of the national collection out there much more immediate. Uh, right. and, and places were able to locally upload uh, information as well. So if you're looking for information that may be in another part of the country and it's created there locally, you may have a harder time finding it uh, 
you know, through the old system, but now it may be uploaded and, and, and easier to find. So, uh, and then another good feature about that is instead of just one book per cartridge, let's call them cartridges. We'll call them cartridge. <laughs> um, you can now fit, uh, I think it's about 15 titles, 15 or 20 titles on a cartridge now. So you're able to make, uh, as a patron of the Talking Book Services, you're able to, you know, get um, a lot more material in a, in a way that's much easier to handle than dealing with 20 cartridges. Right. One. Yeah, so, that's a lot more convenient than having to be mailed individual cartridges, like you said, or, you know, waiting on libraries from other states to send this information over to you. Absolutely. And if I, if I could make a plug for it too, yeah, they used to require a doctor's signature to say that you had a, had a visual disability, uh, that you were blind. And now they are, uh, Library of Congress is allowing educators and librarians uh, to sign off for a patron to say that they're eligible for the service. So they've relaxed some of those uh, requirements to become a patron. And if you, or if, you know, talking directly to your listeners, if you were, uh, or your family member, um, is having difficulty seeing or difficulty with regular print, um, jump online, reach out to, uh, reach out to our talking book services or go into your local library and ask questions about it. And they'll get you directed to us because, um, now you don't have to go to a doctor. You don't have to go to an eye specialist to to get this diagnosis. You can just be uh, deemed eligible for the service by either an educator or a librarian. That's wonderful. Yeah. And for our listeners that are curious or interested in, in acquiring these services for yourself or someone in your family, someone that you know, you know, you can come into one of your local library branches um, and we can get online and go to the, the State Library of Kansas website and get that information for you, print off any forms we need to do. I'm not entirely sure um, who in the organization can approve that. It might be at the director level or it might be at the branch manager level, depending on that relationship they have with that customer. But um, we can certainly get you that information and, and get that routed to the State Library of Kansas. Yep. And the Talking Books crew can help anybody out with that as well. Oh, for sure. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Eric uh, Norris, for joining us today. This has been so fascinating and really enlightening, um, sharing all of these resources and uh, connections with our customers. Uh, we do appreciate everything that you all do for us and keeping us um, informed because like we had said earlier, this past year has been really hard to stay connected, especially in finding uh, reliable information. So thank you again. Uh, thank you so much for having me. This was a this was an absolute pleasure. And uh, hopefully I didn't drift too far away from the notable books. But like I said, I just uh, I enjoy talking with librarians about library stuff. So thank you very much. Most definitely. It was just an appetizer. <laughs> we had to enjoy our whole meal. <laughs> <laughs> Have a wonderful day. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Today, we are joined by three librarians who will share noteworthy short stories from local writers who submitted their works to our short edition webpage. This is Mr. Bill from the Children's Room, and today I'll be reading Bruce the Obtuse Goose by Emily Lucille Millspaw. Bruce the Goose was quite obtuse. His brain was split pea small and most of his friends at Fitzner's farm didn't care for him at all. Morton Mouse in his Swiss cheese house would say, That Bruce is a pain! He's so dumb I saw him once try to swim through heavy rain! Henrietta Hen in the chicken pen agreed that Bruce was dense. She concluded as such after Bruce got stuck in a goat-sized hole in the fence. Phyllis the filly thought Bruce was quite silly, but not in a laughable way. She'd say with a snort, That goose couldn't find the sun on a cloudless day. Now it happened one night, when the moon was bright, that a wolf found his way to the farm. He was wily and woolly, sneaking up to the hen house, reaching in with his long, wolfy arm. Fitzner's farm was asleep, from the hens, not a peep, while this wolf began planning his dinner. But our Bruce was out walking and saw this wolf stalking and did something that made him a winner. 
He honked and he shouted and he ran all about, rousing his friends from their slumber. The wolf heard the din and ran far, far away with no hen as his dark type of hunger. Sure, Bruce the goose was quite obtuse, but he was also very brave. And now his friends on Fitzner's farm, whose lives he helped to save, they call him Bruce the Courageous Goose and Bruce my bestest friend. They all respect their friend the goose and his noisy honk. The end. I'm Not Going to Send This by Sierra Powers. Read by Daniel Peewee Wardy. My bestie. I was terrified of the three-lane highways the first time you brought me here. Your car was dented and scratched to oblivion, the scars of living here. But this just meant that one more mark would merely enhance the natural pattern. Now I drive them like a native, with the appropriate amount of disdain yet appreciation, peppered with profanities of probable parentage and propensity. I calmed down when we found the massive chicken perched on top of bright red brick. But peace came with a six-pack of donuts in a spectrum of colors under the watchful, bright green eyes of the tiger. We were good to go after that. Everything only a mildly inconvenient 10 to 20 away. This block has changed, though, since you left, and now it's a strange triangle that has attracted more wonderful things. The truly dedicated can go soup, beer, pizza, beer, donut, and coffee, then back home before the dark gets too dark. We ate truffles by the pond, enjoying the geese as they lazily drifted by and running away from them when they demanded their share. Now I have to keep my son from ponying them up and my husband from devouring them all. I moved here. I became one of you, even though you had to leave, which of course you did. You'd been here forever, and all of you was already here. You needed to go create more bits of you to bring back because this town, I do so declare, is a collection of everyone's favorite things. There's space in the 10 to 20 to just keep tacking it on. Airplanes fly too low over the capital, so to pretend that you either stay or you stay gone is nonsense. I'm raising my family here, for now, for until it's better for me to not. Maybe the time is never, but I don't have to decide that. I can just watch and wait, and maybe I'll keep watching the planes, and maybe... I'll be on one. That'd be harder to do if you came back, though. So far, here has become a collection of my favorite things, but there is one very specific gap left. So every time you mention nostalgia, I bite my tongue and simply say, I have plenty of space if you give in. Of course, I do because the housing is cheap, and like I said, I've been keeping a spot for you. I promise, it's not a sign of giving up. It's not taking the easy way out. It's slowly becoming a new place every day. I'll be able to show you it this time around. Perhaps we'll start under those tiger eyes. Perhaps they'll be gone. Honestly, the eyes are more symbolic than essential. But you already know this, and you don't need anyone telling you what to do. Signed, not your keeper, me. Hi, I'm Noelle Barrick. I'm in the adult programming department at the Wichita Public Library. This story is called At My Mother's Breast by Ray Wright. My mom didn't die of breast cancer. She was 50 when she felt the lump and she lived another 20 years or so after the mastectomy. Dad told me, a kid starting her second decade of life, that the lump was gone. When mom got out of the shower the first time, I saw the ragged scar going down one side of her torso, 
and I cried because I didn't realize that a huge chunk of my mom would go with the lump. She didn't have to go through chemo because the cancer was gone, but at what cost? There was pain and darkness, and she had a young kid and a not-supportive husband, and then she had to start living. If she was going to live, she wanted a comedy, not a weepy soap opera. We lived a lower-middle-class life with few luxuries, and I don't know how we didn't slide lower, but I assume it was Mom who kept us afloat and had aspirations for a better life for me. And she hustled. She drove school buses, cooked in a nightclub that was owned by my dad's crony, and then, in a misguided attempt at entrepreneurship, my dad bought a liquor store and we owned a business. Mom didn't have money for a fancy prosthesis. She did go to the fabric store, where she bought a hunk of foam rubber. Dad customized his vans himself, and Mom would upholster them with cushions she sewed and stuffed with foam rubber sheets. They were kids of the, of the Depression, and do-it-yourself was the way they always did it. Mom used the electric tur turkey carver she bought at deep discount from Kmart and started shaping the foam rubber into her new lefty. Success was achieved as she now had a serviceable new left bosom. Before her handiwork, people failed to notice the blank spot. It was something wrong that they failed to discern. It was the door handle that was three inches off the standard height, the line at the store that snaked the wrong way. It was the Southern Baptist preacher who forgot to say good morning before starting a church service. It was not completely right. If you know materials, you know that most foam rubber is feather light. Mom's boob would rise up from her bra, so she needed ballast for the errant tit. Personally, I would think of fishing weights or marbles, but Mom had a roll of quarters that she carried in her purse for emergencies. Don't ask me what kind of emergencies a roll of quarters would get you out of. I'm assuming that it was harder to spend than cash, so that's why they were handy. The time that we were at the dime store and $3 short is an example of why we needed the roll of coins. Mom reached in her shirt and pulled out her counterfeit mammary gland. The 16-year-old, Mom archly described him as a kid, ringing up the purchases was a ginger, and his blush was so bright that he was a vision of crimson and safety orange. I was probably just as brightly colored from embarrassment. It was the reaction of any embarrassed 13-year-old who felt the need for the earth to open and pull me away from what was ha happening. Mom had a really good laugh later on with my older sisters and her friends. Mom sewed for me. I was involved in music and needed skirts for stage. She would pin patterns and material at the liquor store while she worked. Since she had the foam orb, she had a built-in pincushion. I doubt many noticed pins sticking out of her shirt in not a good way because no customer said anything. One customer did notice and said something. He was a tall, large, weathered biker. Mom said that he was the kind of customer who raised her hackles. He looked at the pin sticking straight out of her and seemingly into her bust. His comment was, Gee, lady, you're one tough stick. One more opportunity for Mom to laugh. Freaking out a biker was such a delicious treat. Her response to the story is, I don't know what a tough stick is, but I'll take it as a compliment. My mom really was a gentle, introverted person. She had many kids and was no stranger to human sexuality, but she always carried herself as more of a June Cleaver than a real housewife of, insert American city name here. But the counterfeit can brought out a devilishness in her that I had never witnessed. By the time Dad had a decent job at an aircraft company, a real for true prosthesis was affordable to her with the new insurance. She had a beautiful pink silicone knocker that matched the size of the other one on her chest. It was so expensive, $200, and it was like winning the lottery that she was able to get the brassiers that went with the knockers for the copay. With a delighted giggle, this 50-something woman would prompt her friends, her grown sons, her macho nephew from Texas to feel her rack to figure out which one was the imposter. It was a test most shirked, and with the Texas nephew, it led to laughter as he and his masculinity had to immediately leave the vicinity. Did my mom cover up the pain of losing a body part? On occasion, I would find her crying, and she would say that it was a story on the news or a song she heard that reminded her of something sad. She never admitted to crying over the lopped breast. 
I hope that I loved her enough to make up for some of that missing flesh. Thank you for sharing those awesome short story submissions. And thank you to the listeners of today's episode. Listeners can submit their own original works to be placed on our short story dispensers by visiting wichitalibrary.org slash services. To participate in the Read ICT Reading Challenge, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash read ICT. And to find a full list of books mentioned in this episode, please visit wichitalibrary.org slash podcast. As always, stay connected with other Read ICT participants on the Read ICT Challenge Facebook page. Find out what's trending near you, post book reviews, look for local and virtual events, and share book humor with like-minded folks. You can follow this podcast through the Anchor app or stream episodes wherever you get your podcast. If you like what you heard today, be sure to leave us a five-star review. This has been a production of the Wichita Public Library, and a big thanks goes out to those staff members who helped produce this episode. I'm your host, Sarah McNeil. Join us next time when we will be discussing Category 5, an illustrated book with local cartoonist, comic strip artist, writer, and orthodontist, Grant Snyder.